Wonder is, is like a, in, in modern philosophy, something you mustn't have. It's like enthusiasm in 18th century England. But you see, I don't know what question to ask when I wonder about the universe. It isn't a question that I'm wondering about, it's a feeling that I have. Because I cannot formulate the question that is my wonder. The moment my mouth opens to utter it, I suddenly find I'm talking nonsense. But that should not uh, prevent wonder from being the foundation of philosophy. Going into our common sense, the 19th century myth, which succeeded the ceramic myth in Western history, I call it the myth of the fully automatic model. Man is a little germ that lives on an unimportant rock ball that revolves about an insignificant star on the outer edges of one of the smaller galaxies. But on the other hand, if you think about that for a few minutes, I am absolutely amazed to discover myself on this rock ball rotating around a, sp a spherical fire. It's a very odd situation. And the more I look at things, I, I cannot get rid of the feeling that existence is quite weird. There is obviously a place in life for a religious attitude in the sense of awe, astonishment at existence. And that is also a basis of respect for existence. It has become extremely plausible that this trip between the maternity ward and the crematorium is what there is to life. Here is a tree in the garden and every summer it produces apples and we call it an apple tree because the tree apples. That's what it does. All right. Now here is a solar system inside a galaxy. And one of the peculiarities of this solar system is that at least on the planet Earth, the thing peoples. <laughs> In just the same way that an apple tree apples. Now maybe two million years ago, Somebody came from another galaxy in a flying saucer and had a look at this solar system and they looked it over and shrugged their shoulders and said just a bunch of rocks and they went away. Later on, maybe two million years later, they came around and they looked at it again and they said, excuse me, we thought it was a bunch of rocks, but it's peopling <laughs> and it's alive. After all, it has done something intelligent. Because, you see, we grow out of this world in exactly the same way that the apples grow on the apple tree. If evolution means anything, it means that. But, you see, we, we curiously twist it. We say, well, first of all, in the beginning, there was nothing but gas and rock. And then intelligence happened to arise in it you know, like a sort of fungus or slime on the top of the whole thing. Uh, but we're thinking in a way, you see, that disconnects the intelligence from the rocks. Where there are rocks, watch out. Watch out, because the rocks are going eventually to come alive. I believe that there is a strong distinction between faith on the one hand and belief on the other. That belief is, as a matter of fact, quite contrary to faith. Because belief is really wishing. It's from the Anglo-Saxon root leaf to wish. And belief, stated, say, in the creed, is a fervent hope that the universe will turn out to be thus and so. And in this sense, therefore, belief precludes the possibility of faith because faith is openness to truth, to reality, whatever it may turn out to be.
I want to know the truth. That is the attitude of faith. And therefore, to use ideas about the universe and about God as something to hang on to in the spirit of rock of ages cleft for me and there's something very rigid about a rock and we are finding our rock getting rather worn out in an age where it becomes more and more obvious that our world is a floating world it's a world floating in space where all positions are relative and any point may be regarded as the center a world which doesn't float on anything and therefore the religious attitude appropriate to our time it's not one of clinging to rocks but of learning to swim and you know that if you get in the water and you've nothing to hold on to and you try to behave as you would on dry land you will drown but if on the other hand you trust yourself to the water and let go you will float and this is exactly the situation of faith imagine the idea that the moment you were born you were kicked off the edge of a precipice and you're falling as you fell a great lump of rock came with you and is traveling alongside you and you're clinging to it for dear life and thinking gee I gotta hold on to this see well it doesn't do a thing for you and you learn this it's only making you anxious and it's only when you understand that it doesn't do a thing for you that you let go and relax. So everybody's in this situation. We're all completely insecure. We're all headed straight for death as if we had been condemned by a judge. And yet here we are all clinging on to things. And we, we have all sorts of alibis for doing this. We say, well, I have responsibilities for my dependents and I've got to cling on. But all you're doing is you're teaching your dependents to cling the same way as you are. And, and making them miserable by learning to go on surviving compulsively. So the thing is, same way, if you're caught in a torrent and you try to get out of it by swimming against it, you'll just wear yourself out and you're still carried along with it. So the sensible thing to do is to turn around and swim with it. And if you want to get out of it, swim towards the edge. But go with it. Same way when you're sailing. Always keep the wind in your sails. If you want to go against the wind, tack. But use the wind. So it's this way. You know, we're all in this great stream of change, which we call life. We are the stream. If you imagine you're separate from it and you're being carried along by it as if you were a cork, that's a delusion. You're a wave of the stream itself. So get with it.